Good morning. Uh, what I have here first is a response to one of your suggestions in the last lecture. It's a summary of this SN layer. I'll see you after class. Okay. And <clears throat> so this is what, what all we've done. Okay. We, we have these fits for the low life and the high life. Okay. Most of the time we're in the high life. You, can, uh, you don't need to copy any of this. Not only should it already be in your notes, but I've already posted it on Moodle. So you can get what I'm about to put up here straight from Moodle. Okay. These are formulas. You won't be given these in a, in a test. You need these. And in fact, if I was preparing a formula sheet, I, I'd also make S the subject of this formula, have two formulas, so I didn't have to do the algebra in the test. Not that the algebra is that hard, but, but it'll just save you time. But this sort of stuff, this is data. This will be given, okay? And for bending, F is 0.9, axial 0.75 and 0.72 in these formulas. 0.9 is what we started off in the, this is what happened with the axial. The SN estimate for axial is 0.5 and CL is one, okay? The SN estimate for axial is 0.45 you can get that from 0.9 times 0.5, that's 0.45. And that's what this formula would give you. If you take SN prime as 0.5 SU, you'll get the 0.45 if you use the CL. So you always use 0.5 <coughs> SU in this formula. Okay. Likewise for, for torsion, when CL is 0.58 and you multiply <coughs> um, by 0.5, then you get 0.29, okay? So when you're using this formula, don't change this, this is always 0.5, okay? But this is the sort of stuff you've always been given in one form or another. Then there are a bunch of factors here, okay? This, this occurs frequently in, in engineering. There are a bunch of correction factors for other physical effects. Loading factor, that's above. The gradient or size factor, it's really more of a size factor, but it's called a gradient factor. Surface finish factor. There are two other factors in the book which you don't need to worry about. They're just one as far as this course is concerned. But in practice, you may have to go get those, okay? I figure if you get these ones, you can learn to get the other ones. But here's CG. I've got CL above. CG is on the second page here. And again, this is the stuff that you would be given, okay? CG depends upon the size. And it, as the size gets bigger, you have more imperfections. And so you have a reduced strength. When, you, when CG gets smaller, then the strength goes down. Okay. CS, if it's, if, if it's perfectly polished, which in practice, I'm not sure I've ever seen this, but it may be, um, you get one commercially polished, it's, it's typically around 0.9, but it drops off a bit at high hardness. For this, you will be given the figure that's in the book. We use, we use that figure completely. We don't change it. Then KF, which is the <clears throat> stress concentration factor adjusted for size. This is, this is a size, so not sensitivity, but it's really a size effect. Okay. As size gets smaller, then <clears throat> KF tends towards one. When as size gets larger, KF, the Q tends towards one. Q tends towards zero, size gets smaller, and KF tends towards one. Q tends towards one as the size gets large, and KF equals KT. And that you'd be given to. Okay. Now this is a formula, so you need to have that formula or some version of it. When you have non-reverse loading, you have an alternating load and a mean load, then you apply the respective KF and KF prime to these. So they won't necessarily be the same. Okay. And you don't apply it, you don't double count, don't put it in here, get rid of it. Okay. So that's basically a summary of the fatigue stuff we've done. It's not everything we've done, but it, it's it's a, a significant amount of it. And I'm trying to show you what you'll be given if in, in the final. You'll be given data like this, but you won't be given formulas. Okay. Are there any questions on that? Okay, well, let me show you that this stuff here is, is typical of engineering. We're getting to the end of, of fundamentals here, but there's a general approach.
in design, the first thing you do is, is you assemble things to perform a function, some kind of function. You, you want a cart to carry things from A to B. Well, you're going to, you're going to want to have wheels and you're going to want a certain size given the size of the thing you want to carry or something like that. And so you, you basically set that up. Then the next thing you have to do is you have to power it or something like that. And you want it to last. And so that very quickly after you've got something that does a function, you're addressing the issue of structural integrity. How long do I want it to last? Okay. It, it may be that it's for very limited use. And so you don't have to worry too much about fatigue. On the other hand, it may be for daily use for years, in which case you're going to look for a long time. Then the general approach is you, you, you get some stress and you make it less than the strength and you avoid failure. And stress here, is from analysis. The analysis may be done by somebody else. You might get a chart of, of um, <clears throat> stress concentration factors, for example. Okay. Uh, or you may do it with finite element, or maybe a combination of doing some nominal stress and, and multiplying um, by some stress concentration factors. And it's going to be configuration specific. It's going, to, it's going to reflect the configuration you've got in front of you that you're designing for structural integrity. On the other hand, strength is from testing. You may have to go look this up. It's con conceivable in practice, you'll have to do some testing. Normally, you can find a value that's similar to start with. And then if it turns out that having a more accurate determination is critical to your design, then you do some testing. Okay. And it's going to be material specific. And this is what we've been doing all along. If you have This is one of the most pragmatic sorts of failure, brittle fracture. You really want to avoid this, things will shatter, okay? <clears throat> and the way you do that is you keep the maximum tensile stress less than the ultimate strength. Okay? In fact, since this is, happens, when, when this equals the ultimate strength, you get failure pretty much right away, okay? There are some exceptions. When you start having stress concentration factors, there'll be some side effects on this ultimate strength. If you get this any, for any growth stress, it'll happen right away. So you want to have a safety factor here. This sort of failure is, happens at the speed of sound, several thousand feet per second, and, and it's over in, in a flash. Okay. But there are different size effects. This is arguably one of the simplest criteria. Well, it's not anywhere near as dramatic. You typically want to avoid yielding. And Tresca.
This is a Trasker condition. You just get the maximum shear stress. Now you may not be applying any torque or any direct shear stress. You may have to go find that. It's sigma one minus sigma two divided by two and so on. Okay. And you want that to be less than the your strength divided by two. Okay. That's because in uniaxial tension, when the normal stress gets to SY, the shear stress is half of that. And so it's yielding at SY upon two. This really captures the basic physics. It's slightly more conservative than von Mises. And as far as this course is concerned, it's fine. When you get up and practice, you'll use whatever people use. Okay. It is more common nowadays, but I think it's more of a fashion statement than anything. To have the von Mises stress or equivalent stress less than SY. And this, this is a little, takes a little more calculation to get. And the data does agree with it slightly better. And it's a little less conservative, but, but not unsafely so. But what we just finished doing Now, both these kind of failures are failures in inverted commas. When you, when you get a little bit of yielding, there's a reasonable chance that the device still works. Okay? On the other hand, you're getting close <clears throat> to having more yielding, in which case it may distort enough that it doesn't. Okay? Once you start to yield, it doesn't take much more of an increase in stress to produce uh, significantly more yielding. So, you, and when that happens, you, you may have enough deformation in your, your device that it doesn't work properly or it jams or something like that. The other thing that happens is when you start to yield, you, you tend to have higher stresses and you tend to promote this, you tend to promote fatigue. The, what, what really promotes fatigue though is the alternating stress, not the mean stress. So if this is the mean stress effect, you're okay. okay. And if you have this alternating stress less than, I think the book refers to the endurance limit, that's a common term in practice. It's also the endurance strength. If you keep it less than that, then you'll have indefinite life in steels. We haven't talked about aluminums. This is not quite true in aluminums, but there's something in effect like this in aluminums. If you start to deal with aluminums, you'll need to study that. It's not part of the course though. This is all similar. Then there's a, another thing we did, or there's a couple of others. We did buckling and <coughs> And we did cracks. This buckling, if you had a squat column, became a yield criterion. Okay? And if you had a slender column, there was a, you would order stress or strength that you had to keep below. And cracks, we, we didn't actually have a stress, we had a stress coefficient of a singularity, and we had it less than a fracture toughness. And the same thing happened, and you were right. We avoided quote crack propagation. For a bit of material, that's true. For a ductile material, what we were avoiding was excessive yielding at the crack tip, which uh, would not be far away from crack propagation. There is, and we haven't done it, there are fatigue crack growth of cracks 
which is a combination of these two. And so there'll be more of this stuff you'll see when you get out and practice. But that's that's the way this thing works. To, to, to ensure structural integrity, you need to analyze the thing for whatever stress you think is T, and then um, make sure it's less than the strength which you, <clears throat> which you obtain from tests. Hopefully somebody's done the test or done some similar tests, at least to get you started. And then ultimately you may have to do the test. So that's what, what we've been doing, okay? So that, that takes care of all of this. I shifted these contact stresses when I typed this up, thing up originally. I did it in the order of the chapters in Juvenile and Marshy, but uh, it really makes more sense to put the contact stresses back with stresses and we did that. So we have done this now and we're gonna to move to this part starting today. In fact, what we'll, do, what we'll do today, the first application we'll do is bearings. If we get a chance, we'll do screws. I'll go back and do screws. We've lost a little bit of time with the university being closed for supposed bad weather. Um, I think we lost a couple of lectures there. So we may not get back to that. We'll only do bearings because next week, what we're going to do is going to have a case study. Brent St. Wong is going to come and he'll give lectures on both. Monday, Wednesday, and a shorter lecture on Friday. So that the, yield, the problem session will actually be a lecture next week. There's no problem session this week, it's Good Friday. But next week there will be a lecture. And he'll, he'll take you through. Brent uh, had, has considerable experience in the oil and gas industry, and then he moved from a, a public company to a consulting company. And as a consultant, you see a bigger variety of problems. So he's got a, a, a rich wealth of experience, and he's gonna go through um, I, I think it might be a bearing failure, but he's got several case studies. What you'll have to do in that class is you'll have in-class homework and you need to submit that. You'll get half a point for an attempt for each in-class homework that you try to do. Okay. Uh, they're relatively short, but he's going to have a homework on Monday, which I think you'll have to have, get done later on Monday, and another one on Wednesday, which you have to get done then. So there's going to be two problem sets, I think about three problems each. And they'll be graded the same way the other problem sets are. So the key to get stuff out of this is to participate. But let me comment on what's going to happen in, 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 in the engineering practice. And we had a couple of engineers on to invite you to, to a special topics course. And, and, and they're right, you always have to learn, every time you get out, you have to learn um, new uh, actual applications. Okay? We're not doing that many applications here. Basically what happens in life is you're gonna to have to go learn them. I've been a consultant engineer for over 40 years and I've done a wide variety of problems. It's quite common for me to start a new problem and not have seen this stuff. Then you'll find there's a little bit of a language. If you talk and listen to people and write, take some notes, you can figure out what they're calling what. Some of them may use different terms. They, they sort of tried to point that out to you. And you'll come to terms with that. It really helps you in practice if you can see the actual hardware. You, you can read a drawing and, and that's good. Sometimes drawings are missing something or sometimes you miss something. It's certainly I'm capable of missing something when you look at the drawing. And when you see the actual hardware, you realize that, that it's perhaps aligned slightly differently. So that's a very useful thing. Finding somebody who's knowledgeable, that's extremely useful. So this is what you have to do in practice. So what we're doing in the rest of the course is kind of like what you're gonna see in practice. We're gonna start doing bearings today, okay? And then next week, I'm sure in this case study, there'll be stuff that we haven't done, okay? And you may have to go get the book and read up a bit about it and, and try and do it. I think Brent lets you work in a group if you like to, and, and that's fine, okay? Just be, be clear what group you're working in. And that this will be a bit like real life, but you've got enough of the basics that you should be able to handle this. All right, well, let's start these applications. This is the last section. And the first of these are going to be roller and ball bearings. I'm 
in this application, you're going to use some of the stuff that we've done, basically. You can find this in the text, either edition and chapter 14. Well, here's, this is a bore bearing. Okay, there's bores here, there's a little spacer, keep them separate, okay, in an inner and outer race. And this is a roller bearing. Oh, I didn't do that very well. <laughs> and this thing here has an inner race, which it seems to have inadvertently already got. And an outer race. So the circles are supposed to be concentric and a series of, of rollers in between them. It's a bit hard to see, but the rollers here um, on the inner race just make contact. It's not quite the way I've drawn it. I picked too, too big a roller here. This let me draw it more appropriately. Like that. That's that's for that's for a roller bearing. There's some kind of spacer here, which is this black thing here that keeps the these things spaced out. So this is the outer race. And with a bore bearing, the bore will penetrate both the inner and outer race. With a roller bearing, it doesn't penetrate either. I've drawn this here because of this, this space apart here. It keeps, maintains the spacing. And this, <clears throat> And this is where your shaft goes in the center here. So what's happening is the shaft is rotating and the inner race is, a, is attached, we'll talk about just how in a minute, to the shaft, it's also rotating. So these things are rotating, okay. but this is not rotating, okay. this is fixed. Now the alternative you haven't practiced to this is a thing called a journal bearing. It just looks like this. And you have the shaft inside this, and you have one race, this is fixed. To facilitate the sliding here, you may well have a lubricant. Okay. Why do you have this sort of bearing instead of this? Well, 
Well, it's because rolling friction is low. What'll happen is in effect, the coefficient of friction will go down by an order of magnitude or even two orders of magnitude. I use mu for the coefficient friction so we wouldn't confuse it with f, which was our factor in the SN. But you could use f. If you have rolling without lubrication, then it'll be typically a, a two orders of magnitude. Once you, even when you lubricate, it'll often be an order of magnitude. Okay. And the reason for this is you have no relative motion. Well, no, it's a little bit of grain of salt. It's a little bit, but here's rolling without slipping. This is just translation. These are all the velocities there. If I translate it, if I rotate it, I'll add a velocity to the top and a subtractive velocity to the bottom. If you add these two up, nothing's happening in the center here. So the center advances with velocity V. The top, on the other hand, advances with velocity 2v, and you saw this in dynamics, I believe, and the bottom is zero. Okay. So in effect, you've got no relative motion, so you have no friction. So that, that's the big plus. So what does this mean? In practice, it means you have less power use and power loss. So that's a definite plus. These bearings are more complicated than this. Um, so that's a bit of a minus. But when you have to lubricate this, it's not so clear. So nearly always you have a certain size shaft, a one inch shaft, and you go get a journal bearing from a catalog, or you go get a ball bearing or a roller bearing, you're gonna find the roller bearing costs more. When you use it, most of the time, um, well, a lot of the time you're gonna want a lubricant, in which case the long-term cost of the journal bearing is gonna be higher. If you can just put some kind of coating on the journal bearing and not have a lubricant you have to replenish, then it can be, uh, still very comparable cost. But the other thing that's, that's bad here for roller bearings is they're more prone I showed you this a bit earlier, but as you rotate this, the rollers move around, so this this thing inner race has seen cyclic contact, and so is the outer race, and the rollers themselves are seen contact, and so they have alternating stresses. Okay, as you spin this around, and it's more prone to failure. The journal bearing, that's not the case. Okay, the shaft uh, might be under being something, but the journal bearing itself, it's not. So that that's that's um, that's a loss. So we tend to use these things for. <clears throat> where they're best. OK, 
if we have light to moderate loads, we can keep the cyclic spaces underneath the endurance limit and stop the fatigue problem by sizing our ball bearings. Yep. Well, I, I can't hear what you're saying. But... Well, you need to turn off the mute. Let me define geometry. Can you mute him, Dr. Sinclair? Um, I'm afraid I don't know how to do that. Last time I tried to do this, I managed to mute myself, I think. <laughs> so hopefully he's going to wake up. All right, now you're muted. Okay, now? Good now. Okay. Thank you for your help. We're going to define some aspects of the geometry here. This inner diameter is the bore diameter. And the outer diameter, which is called D, it's just D. And there'll be in here some rolling component. And its diameter will be dr. And here for this, so up here, here, here are the dimensions. Usually this is about twice this, not, not precisely, but, but this one here I measured before class, D was two and three quarter inches. DB was one and a quarter. And the, I couldn't really get the radii accurately, but as best I could, it looked like about three eighths of an inch. So that's going to be typical, okay? This, this will be a, about twice this, and this will be a fraction of this, okay? There's some more geometry in the housing. And I'll sketch this figure, but there's a better figure in the book. So you may not want to copy my drawing, which is not the greatest, but this will be, this is a, um, A ball bearing. Okay. This is this is the outer race. There's a radius here, and it sits. There's a radius there too, and it sits in the housing. I've drawn these as sharp. I'll, I'll do a more detailed drawing in a second. So this height here 
to the center line is t upon two. That's this outer diameter, okay? This is dh. to the center line. And so it has to be or dh upon two is less than d upon two or dh is less than d. So that, that's what houses it, the housing comes in. The same thing happens in here, more or less. This distance here to the center line is db upon two. And this is the shaft. And when you're designing bearings, Usually somebody sort of given you the shaft diameter. The shaft is done from other considerations. But this being the case, then you have to have DS greater than DB. So when they come with a given shaft, you're going to pick something with a bore diameter which is slightly less so that you can fit the thing in. Let me show you how that fitting works a little more carefully. There's usually a straight part. Then there's a radius. Ah. No, it's not it's supposed to be a subscript. And so what's going to happen here is that <clears throat> you want db upon 2 plus r to be less than ds upon 2. Or if you like, db plus 2r has got to be less than ds. So when you, we'll look at some of these geometries in a moment for these bearings. When you're given a DS, when you start looking at bearings, you need to pick DB less than DS, and then the chart will give you these little radii R, okay? And they're always like this. They start off horizontal, parallel to the sharp, and then they're orthogonal to it. Then there's a straight part. The straight part might have zero length, okay? It's possible, okay? <clears throat> But you want that, and whatever radii that bearing has, multiply by two and make sure it's less than ds. And that's what's going to make this thing fit in here. Now, in capstone design, it's very likely you have to pick some of these bearings. <coughs> so that's the first thing you do. You'll have some life considerations. We'll deal with that later today. So what's going to happen is you're going to turn the shaft down to make this end of it fit in the bearing. Okay. You want to size <clears throat> the amount you, you, you put this in be a little bit bigger than dB. Excuse me.
what's the difference between a shouldered shaft and a step shaft? Does a step, does a step shaft just go get like a larger diameter and then come back down to the smaller diameter? Um, <clears throat> I think it'll depend a little bit who you ask that question to, but by and large, the, the terms are used interchangeably. So there's, there's a step down here in the shaft, <clears throat> or you can call this a shoulder, okay? <clears throat> you could call it a fillet. So a number of terms. But basically what, what's happening here is we look at the end on in this, then, then this view is always gonna look like This is the, this is the smaller diameter and a larger diameter looking end on, and then this is the shape in here. And as I said, though you, you could you can do this, you can have the radii, which which goes all the way around, or you can have a straight bit here. I have not seen in practice anybody do this. You pick a bigger radii and do that, at least not in shafts where they meet bearings. The reason for that is you want this thing to rest hard up against the, the bearing. This will be a radius in the bearing. You'll put this radius when, the, when you're turning, okay? When you're turning it so the two match. If you make these things match nicely, you have no stress concentration here or very little. So to answer your question, those terms are used somewhat interchangeably. But <clears throat> you, you want an interference fit. So you turn it down and say, so you want about half a thou. Um, it's going to turn out when we start looking at these numbers, nearly all the numbers and bearings are in SI units. Timken is the big US manufacturer. I think Timken was Scandinavian, I don't know. But anyway, they have SI units. Uh, S and K are the biggest um, other bearing manufacturers and they use SI units. So about 10 microns. <clears throat> so how do you get it in? Well, you have a tap fit. Uh, press fit. If you're doing a lot of assembly of this stuff, you may have a hydraulic cylinder that pushes them in. That, that, that'll that be a consistent fit. Tap fit is you tap it in with a hammer. Sometimes you do a shrink fit. <clears throat> One way to do that is to put the shaft in dry ice, okay? and then put it in and then when it when it comes up to room temperature, it'll expand it and you get the interference. You don't want too tight a fit. What you're trying to ensure is that this uh, part of the bearing fits snugly on this, so it rotates with this, and the differential motion is taken up with the rolling elements. Okay, that's what you're trying to do. And they slip pretty easily, so you don't need to have this very snug to make it fit on this. What's not so obvious is if you make it in tighter, you get bigger contact stresses. We haven't really talked about this. When you have contact stresses, let me push down with this pen here. Right underneath that, those are compressive, but around here, you get tensile stresses as it pulls in. If I had a softer piece of material, you might be able to see that better. Let's see. Uh, well, it's not, I don't think you can see it, but you can try it yourself. It, it get, get, um, a pen or something like that and push on a cushion. And you'll see little wrinkles around here. And so there are some tensile stresses. The stresses we did in contact stresses were all compressive. Though they do not affect the fatigue light. Those tensile stresses though, they alternate, you go around and when you make it too tight, they get a bit bigger and they reduce the fatigue light. So when you first start doing this in capstone design, fitting a bearing, 
don't think that really tight is great. Okay, this is about what you want. Okay, that's about the amount of interference you want. And tap fit is something where you you don't belt it really hard with a hammer. You tap it in. Okay, I use the word tap advisedly. It, it or or you try to shrink. Okay, you might use a press, but this is not good if you do this. It's it's a natural thing to do when you're first putting your first bearings in because you think. You know, making it tight is really good. Well, yes and no. Now, on the other hand, if you don't have much in the way of life requirements, it's not a big deal. Let's talk about bearing selection. The available dimensions for standard bearings are given in some detail in Table fourteen point one. Here's a bit. Of table 14.1. This is a much better figure showing the housing. It's got the radius in it. It's, it's more carefully drawn than my figure. Okay, so figure 14.11. But here's <clears throat> here, here's a, a, a bore. The inner bore is about an inch here. Okay, the outer bore varies, okay. and the width varies as these beams get bigger. Sorry, these bearings get bigger and bigger. Okay. And as a result. They have a different number in the front here. One is L, that's that's extra light loads. Two is light, and three is moderate. That's the sort of range where fatigue is not a problem. And this is the radius here that you're given in the width. So you want, if you take dB plus two twenty-five millimeters plus two times 1.28, that'll be uh, twenty-six point two eight. You need a, a shaft which is 27 millimeters to use this bearing. Okay. On the other hand, if you had this bearing, 25 millimeters, its radius is 1.02, two times that, 2.04, 27.04. In round figures, you need a 28 millimeter shaft to use this bearing. It usually go the other way. You get the shaft and you come into this list and you pick your bore. That's the, that's one of the first things you do. When you pick your bearing, so you're going to be given DS. You're going to pick DB less than DS, and it has to be less by by two R. Okay, once you do that. You get a bearing number, but <clears throat> the first part of this bearing number is either L, one, sorry, two or three, two or three. This is for extra light loading. Two is for light. And three is for medium. Then the number that follows is the db it's one of this the next number that follows is db divided by five let me show you suppose i picked this bearing here okay then its bearing number would be l because it's light and then i divide 25 by five and it's L05, 
and that's the number that they gave you. Okay, so you just divide these by five. Uh, Seventeen divided by five, close enough to three. Okay, and that's how you'd call your bearing out. Well, we have to go and, and allow for these loads. Dr. Sinclair. Yes. Could you uh, give some examples for what extra light, light, and medium loading would look like? Oh. Yeah, I'm just trying to think. Uh, you, you usually, for money reasons, you usually use um, journal bearings on little carts, but that, that would be light loading. The, the reason you don't use um, roller and, and uh, ball bearings on little carts that people, like shopping carts and things like that, that those are light loads. That, that This would work well there. They're not used because of money, okay? That, that they cost more and, and the general bearings work okay because of the loads. That, that's light loads. When you start to have a car, then uh, you can, you, you, an automobile will use uh, roller bearings on, on a number of its uh, components when the loads are not too bad, okay? But typically not wheels. Uh, it's not completely true, but that's typically. So that starts to get get to be a significant load. But what's the load on a radial load on a wheel in a, in a car? Oh, can be somewhere between five hundred and a thousand pounds. Somewhere in that range, is you start to think about journal bearings. Um, that's not to say you can't use uh, wall bearings there. Then there's some very heavy machinery. Where you're when you're moving um, conveyor belts with uh, tons of material on them, and the tension in the these belts gets significant, okay, or can be significant, um, and and you get loads that are of the order of thousands of pounds. Uh, that's almost certainly a general bearing. Okay, so so day to day experience, sort of light loads. For yourself, the things you handle, you won't see journal, uh, sorry, ball and roller bearings there that much because of money, okay, but they could be used. Then there's sort of medium loads, I might say medium loads of the order of a few hundred pounds. Um, and then, uh, but I'll think about that a bit more. Then there's heavy machinery uh, where you get uh, massive loads. And, and those are going to be journal bearings. Okay. Does that sort of answer your question? Uh, yes, sir. I, I can give it some more thought, but okay. um, and, and see if I can think of something a bit better than that. Well, we're going to start talking about life requirements, okay? And, and this will this will somewhat answer your your uh, question too, okay? In fact, in fact I, could, I could get you an answer of sorts. Next thing, we, we, geometry is the first thing that, that you have, but <clears throat> I have to confess that, that there's a table here which gives the loads in kilonewtons, and I, I um, I tend to always think in terms of US units, so I haven't thought too much about what those numbers mean, or as much as I should have. But anyway, life is going to be governed by fatigue. And the fatigue is due to cyclic loading. So L is inversely proportional to the radial load to some, that's proportional sign, okay? F upon R. It's a life and we're gonna measure that in revolutions.
And so this radial load Here's your in and out of race. That's radially out like this. Okay. And what we're going to have to do is figure out what alpha is. Okay. And get this proportionality. Then we can do some tests to calibrate this. And then when we change FR, we'll be able to see what our life is and see if we get enough life. So we'll do that after a break. Roger Sinclair. Yes, sir. In, uh, when you were going over the diagram of the bearing use, you were given values such as uh, DH, DS, DR. What did DH uh, signify again? D DH is the housing diameter. And and that that's something you do after the fact. You, 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 you come into your design with a shaft and you pick your bearing. Okay. Once you pick your bearing, then you have to house it as well. And, that, and so that's an outer ring that holds the bearing in place. And let me see, let me get that. Okay, here's, here's their drawing, which is better. Well, yes and no, <laughs> it's not so obvious to me. Okay, okay. Um, this is, they've done a, a more complicated situation. I just drew this as one piece. This is the housing here. This is a cap on the end of the housing. And, and this is this is the other piece of the housing here, and so this part here pushes against the the outer race of the bearing on this side, and this cap cements the, the bearing on this side. And this, this is a true drawing. I mean, this, this is what happens in practice. You put a cap in here to, to house it. So I just drew the housing when I did my drawing. I didn't worry about distinguishing between the cap and the and the and the other part, the central part of the inner part of the housing. So so DH is this. Um, here we go. It's the diameter, the inner diameter of the housing. Okay. And it's got that's got to be less than less than D, so it hops, so it traps that outer race. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. This is this is actually a pretty realistic figure. It's it shows these pieces here. Okay. Uh, yeah. This is a spacer, but you you don't normally want that to have any sort of contact with the shaft. I hadn't noticed that before. Now, it would be better if this figure was shaded where the metal was or something like that. So you, you don't really want any contact here. Otherwise, you've got to affect the journal bearing. So, so that it's a better drawing than mine, but this, this detail here is a little questionable. Okay. Are these situations, uh, do they change up much if say the shaft is uh, the stationary object and the outer radius is the one that is rotating? Ooh. I'm trying to think of an instance. Nothing readily comes to mind. Okay. It, it, yes, you could, you, could have, you could have a device but nothing readily comes to mind. That's not to say there isn't any. You, you could have something where you mounted the inner uh, bore on a shaft that was stationary and drove the outside part. I guess a fan or something like that um, would be would be similar to. Oh, well, no, a fan. The shaft drives it, drives the fan. Okay. No, but you could have something like that where, where you you drove uh, perhaps from a pulley drive the outer race rather than the inner race. Yeah, that's that's unusual, but but it could happen. You'll get this FR that we're talking about here will still control the life, okay? Whether, whether the inside part is moving or the outside part is moving, this will still, will still be governed by this. Okay, any other questions? Wouldn't that be like a tapered uh, roller bearing for a car? The outside race moves, right? Because the spindle stays uh, still. The, the, spin, the spindle turns inside, okay? So... I mean, for, for a car, it, it's just stationary and then the, everything's, the, everything spins around it. What, what bearing are you talking about? For a wheel bearing, those tapered roller bearings? Well, you, ha you have a, a spindle that fits inside those, right? 
and that rotates. I, I'm not quite clear what you're what you're talking about, but that's my fault, not yours. Okay, let's take a break for five minutes. Well, let me get going again. So let's call this a life equation. It just reflects this. So we had L was proportional to one upon FR. That's still there. We're just normalized by LR and by C. So that's L is the life for FR. C is the load. For LR, and, and some usually call the radial load capacity, hence the letter C. For a given bearing, and LR is a standard life used in tests. Cycles of rev revolutions. This number may vary with different manufacturers. This is a very common number. It's the one that's in the book. I have no idea why somebody picked nine times 10 to the seventh, but um, you, you, this order of magnitude is the right order of magnitude, but why nine? I, <coughs> excuse me, I don't know.
So we want to get an estimate of alpha. This is the fatigue situation. So we ought to be able to estimate alpha with what we know about fatigue. Well, this is going to be high cycle. And so we had this equation here for high cycle. N So this is the life, okay. Uh, this is the the stress that's been seen. Okay, and so L is one proportional to the force, one upon the force to the alpha. This is S. So this this thing here is like one um, <clears throat> reciprocal minus this is like an alpha prime. Why a prime? Because I don't have force here. If I had force here, then this would have been alpha. Would have, would have been. I want to get the reciprocal. I want the alpha on the bottom, so I take minus. Okay. And we can do axial loading, and see what this thing looks like. S n prime. When you take the loading factor, it's 0.5 times the slowing factor is 0.45 SU. SN would then be, I've put the slowing factor in it already, CG, CS. I put two primes on that to distinguish it from SN prime that I had in the handout. That's already got the loading factor in. And CG, well, these things are small, okay? So it's reasonable to think the, the, the contact areas, not, you've done enough contact problems. When you even have um, three eighths of an inch radius on your, your roller, like we had in the first case, that it'll be a fraction of that, okay? And so it's going to be in this range in here. So it's going to be C, G, it's 0.8. And C, S, these things are pretty better than machined. It's not commercially polished. I'd, I'd say it's, it's uh, sorry, it's, it's not mirror polished, but it's commercially polished. And so if you go look on one of these sheets, fine ground or commercially polished, CS will be about 0.9. It could drop off if we had a higher hardness, but that, that'll do. And if, on this handout here was 0.75. So this alpha prime then, dog 0.8, times 0.9, times 0.45, over 0.75. Did you forget your division sign? Sorry? Did you forget your division sign on alpha prime? 
So if we get to this, the, the sign is correct here. Isn't, is it negative three over log? Yes. All right, so. Oh, okay. Yes, you, you'd like me to write. I, I, I can see what you said. Oh, yes. Yes. Yes, sure. Sorry. I get minus 8.2. Okay. Well, yeah, yes, I, I, I didn't understand you quickly. Yes, I've got to divide by that. Yes, that's right. And, and this is numbers less than one, so this is negative, so it gets rid of the negative. And this log is, is less than one. Um, divide into three, you get minus 8.2. Oh, and the minus goes away. Well, we have zero one loading here. Not fully reversed, okay? So, <clears throat> so that means that S on the Goodman diagram become S effective. But the mean loading here is underneath these rollers, not beside them, but underneath these rollers is compressive. So S effective equals sigma A, which will be P naught. So what we have then is The minus alpha prime. Okay. The sigma A, well, we want to get this in terms of the force. And for roller bearing, from our contact stress analysis, You have to divide FR by the width of the, the bearing, which we call L. So then alpha, so now this is FR, we put that in here, we get a half, and so alpha is just this, this 4.1. For bore bearing, Formula for P naught was six FR T star squared and this is one third. So alpha equals one third of that two point seven. So we get a difference in these powers between roller bearing and, and of the order of four or so and of the order of three or so. Well, if we didn't have some tests, that's what we'd have to use. It's a very good thing we've got tests because it's going to turn out that these, while this indicates the kind of thing that's going on, you're much better off to actually test them.
And what you do is you plot the load on the vertical axis and the light on the x-axis, just like SN. We want the argument of the log function to be dimensionless, so it's going to be log L over LR over that 9 times 10 to the ninth. Nine times ten to the seventh. I'm sorry. Okay. And this is going to be log of your actual FR over the, the load that produces LR. Okay. And the way this. What this is LR work. again? Sorry. What is LR again? LR is a uh, nine times 10 to the seventh, and C produces LR. That's called the capacity, okay. And this data looks like this. And if you fit a line inside it, then if you look at our, our life equation, we had L upon LR equals C upon FR T alpha. If we take logs of both sides, take log 20 degrees of power, you get the alpha in front of the log. This is X. So if I multiply across, this is Y. But we've got log of FR upon C, so that's going to make it minus. So the slope here, this negative slope, the magnitude of that is one upon alpha. Okay, the slope is negative, so that that'll knock out that negative, and and the that slope of that line, that inside line get you one up on alpha. This is what testing gets. Okay. So our estimates were rough, but they went out to lunch. We, we had a bit over four here and a bit under three here. We had, we did have a lower alpha, excuse me, I'll put on the light, a lower alpha for four bearings. But we would get significant errors if we use our rough estimate. But it cho shows you, though, that the, the fatigue stuff we've done gives you an indication of the trends here, and the testing confirms that. Okay. And so our, what we'll have then is L, go back to this, we'll have L equals LR C over FR to the 10 upon 3 for roller. And likewise, so if you give me a, a C, if you measure a C, which is, we'll get a table of that, and then you give me your FR, I know what this is, and I know this power, then I can get the light. Let me do a little simple example.
me show you this 11 to 22. 11 to 22. If you double the radial load, what happens? We'll do this for both roller and ball bearings. So L we're going to divide, we're going to get an expression for this, it'll be L R C upon F R, and then this will be another expression of this will be upon two F R. And this will be the same expression, be LRC upon FR. And so this is going to be the C and the LR will cancel. So that's a half raised to the power of 10 upon 3. Point oh nine nine. On the other hand, if you do it for a ball bearing, well, the same thing is going to happen. You're going to get a half, but it's now to the power of three, and that's 0 0.125. So this different power makes a difference. Here you have about 10% left, 90% drop for roller, whereas you have a 87.5% drop for board. So you want to maintain this distinction between these two. You're going to get some changes in life when you do that. Sometimes you get a little casual about these. Uh, it's, it's going to make a difference. Dr. Sinclair, what's that last percentage value for the ball bearing? 90%. Oh, this is very close to 0.1, right? So that's a 10, that's a, uh, you get 90% drop. You've got 10% of the life left. You have a 90% drop. This is about 12 and a half percent. It's not as significant. Okay. And so you've got an 87.5% drop for the ball. Okay. So the, the, the book gets a little casual about distinguishing between these two. You, you don't want to do that. Okay. You, you get changes in your answers and that are not something you want to give away. So if you give an L, okay. determine the C required. And then you pick the bearing from table Get the C required. Mm -hmm. 
required capacity. That's going to be FR, whatever your load is, times the life that you want, times this LR. And I've, I've moved this to the other side here. We've changed the life equation, so I've moved it over the other side. So I've taken this over, we put C here, put L over LR, then I take the reciprocal of that. So it's not point, it's 10 over 3, the reciprocal is 0.3. Let me do a simple example and show you how this works. All right, this is, I should have showed you this. We're going to use this in a second. These are these bearing capacities. Okay? <clears throat> you have the bore, then you have extra light, which, which has the symbol L, or this, this L, light and medium, 200. And they have different capacities. They can take different loads okay, to get a, a life of uh, 90 times 10 to the 6, the same as I had 9 times 10 to the 7, okay, which is fairly, fairly common to be used. Well, here's an example of how we can do this. We typically use uh, radial or angular ball bearings. Oh, we're going to start off using radial, and I'll talk about angular. The ang angular, we've got several other aspects to this, but let me just do the basic aspect to start with. But Alfred is not, that's a pure radial bearing, that's that, okay? Angular, um, I, unfortunately, we've been using alpha for this power, okay? Uh, that, that's a, an angular inclination of the bearing that will take more thrust. We, we, so far, we've just dealt with radio loads, so we haven't worried about thrust, okay? Uh, but th this will handle thrust loading. I, ha I have an angular one I can bring in the next slide. Here's some specs. I believe I got these from an example in the book, problem in the book. The radial load is 1.2 kilonewtons or 1200 newtons. Are well, you going to run this thing, this bearing, eight hours a day? At 1800 RPM. And you want it to last for 10 years. So we need to identify a bearing number. The first thing we do, here's a general approach. The first thing we do is we go and find acceptable geometries. And there'll be a range of them.
broader ailment. And that, that will consult with table 14.1 to do that. Then we'll determine this required life. So we'll determine C reg, we have to determine the, the life, we'll turn this into revolutions and we can determine C reg from one of these equations. We'll be using Bohr, so it'll be one third. And then we'll use table 14.2. Now, if I look at table 14.1, I didn't make it copy far enough down. I only went up to about 25 millimeters. My oversight, but I can look at this up here. On the next page, we're going to want a, we've got we've got a shaft diameter which is 50, so a bore diameter has to be less than that. So 45 would be possible here. They have different radii. The radii here for 45. Uh, 1.02 and 1.52. So so the, the, the biggest way I can go to would be 45. I could go this. Those, those are the um, the radio. Then if I add two times this to this, it'd be a little bit over two plus 45, 47 plus, let's say 48. And that's less than 50. So that works. This one would also work. Multiply this by two, it's 3.04. 45, that'd be 49. That would still work. So anything... <clears throat> So dB less than 45 or equal to, to 45 is okay for this for this application. Now we want to go determine the life and what's the required capacity, then we'll pick something off that has a capacity bigger than that. So C reg required is this FR which we're given times L over L uppercase R, which is the nine times ten to the seventh to the one third for ball bearing. We need to know what L is. Well, we were given eight hours a day. And every hour we have 60 minutes. And every 60, every minute we have 1800 RPM. And that would get us through one day. That gets us through a year and we want 10 years. So this is a large number. Let's see what it is. This is bigger than, than our R. Okay. So C required C these tables of bearing capacities, the units here are kilonewtons. So we'll leave this in kilonewtons. This LR was nine times 10 to the seventh. If I knock off 10 to the seventh, I have to have nine, and I multiply by 10 squared.
about 3.27. So we need a capacity of 3.9, 3.93 kilonewtons. So we go look at these bearings with a bore of 45 and the capacity here, even for extra light is 5.8, 9.1, 14.8. So we can get by with the extra light. So it's L. And so 45, we divide by five. Sorry, 09, my mistake. That's the bearing number. There are a bunch of other bearings that would work. Okay, <clears throat> the cost, the, the, the smaller you make the the, the uh, your bearing, the cost tends to go down. But if you made it smaller in diameter down here, then you have a bigger turn down, and you don't want that. Okay, you'd like to make your turn down um, small, less machining involved. Uh, also, there there are some possible stress problems if you start making it much smaller. So you tend to pick. The smallest, the the biggest bore bearing that'll do the job. Okay, but <clears throat> uh, but it could have been that we found, for example, that this thing here was say six, then this one wouldn't have worked. Okay, these two would have, but this, <clears throat> okay, okay, and so these two would have worked here. So we go to an extra strength um, or higher strength, higher load capacity bearing. In this case, they all work. So we tend to pick the lightest one. This will have the smallest width and, and the smallest cost. Okay. There could be some reasons why you would pick. So there are certainly others. There could be some reasons why you pick these. It might turn out that it has a very convenient width. When you go back to the other table, you get a different width for both of these. And, and it may turn out that you've got a housing that handles one of these. These are the sort of things that when you use catalogs, you, you pick what's convenient given other constraints. But this would certainly work. Are there any questions on that? They're, they're going to be. So you said, yep. So you said the white, pick the widest bearing, but with the, the biggest uh, bearing width. Yes, the biggest bore. Okay. So you had the minimum turn down, but that's the common choice. There could, there could be some reasons for different choices, but that, that's a common choice. So you, you first of all, you go, you're given the sharp line, that ends this from other design considerations. Then you go find, okay, well, this was, the, was really pretty easy, but go find what's the biggest bore I could have and ha fit that shaft into it. Okay. In this case, um, with the radii, if we added twice the radii, the radii was about one for this here, two times one is two plus 45, 47, a little bit more than that. So we call it 48, it's still less than 50. So that works. So we picked the, the, the biggest bore choice. And then the cost in these things will go up as you go across this table. The higher capacity uh, bearings will have more material and more cost. Okay, And so you pick the lightest one that'll do. In this case, if this worked, but what I was saying, if this didn't work, we're at 45, suppose this number was, was seven, we could have gone to two. Okay, Suppose this number was uh, 14, no, let's see, let's say 15. Okay, we go across here, we can't get it, okay? Not not from not from uh, this bearing. Okay? So what are our choices? We have to use something different from the radial bearing. If you go to the angular bearing, you could get it, okay? If you go to a roller bearing, you could get it. So there are other bearings that you could get this thing, and we could use different choices. I just, for the first example, just pick the radial bearing. So there's other things on the chart. If nothing on this chart does it, and the highest we had for 45 <coughs> capacity, would be um, a medium capacity roller bearing, and that would be 20.9. If it was 23, you're looking at a general bearing. Okay, you're not going to be able to do this. Because as you go smaller, these numbers go down. So when you go just below the, the diameter of the shaft, you get your highest capacities. Now you may not need it. The 3.93, we could have gone down to uh, 35 millimeter for 
or even 40 he got it in fact uh you could go down to to 20 if you pick um uh, higher capacity bearing so there's a number of options there there may be some constraints where you'd want to do that but typically no what you're going to do is pick the nearest uh, bore diameter to the, the shaft diameter that works any other questions there are a number of other factors just i wasn't quite sure how far we get today but there are a number of other factors just like we had for the sn we had uh size factors and uh, we never we didn't do a reliability factor, but we will maybe do that for a bearing and so on. When you get into this class next week, uh, you might you may uh, Brent may introduce you to some of those or mention them. In which case, you're going to have to go and look them up. There are a number of other factors that go into the, the this equation that multiply this thing out here and change the requirement. And they can put the requirement up. That's what's going to happen, like an impact factor or something like that. Um, I'll cover that next lecture. Um, but I won't be in class next week. Um, you, you'll have Brent teaching this, and then I'm going to post problem set uh, solution for problem set seven this afternoon, and problem set eight. I problem set eight is not due next week because you've got this case study. It's due the following Wednesday. Okay, so we'll have another lecture on bearings before we we can do problem set eight. Okay, uh, and that'll be not this coming Monday, the 5th, but the 12th of April. And then the uh, the homework will be due on the 14th. Okay. Any questions? Dr. Sinclair, I have a question. Sure. Um, is there any sort of indefinite life with these bearings? I've, I've just been seeing the nine times 10 to the seventh or sixth uh, life requirement, but is there any kind of indefinite life for these bearings? Hmm. I need to think about that. Um, indefinite life. If you if you change this, we had ten years here. <clears throat> I think as a practical matter, if you chose a hundred, <clears throat> it's quite likely that whatever device you're putting in will not be around for hundred. So in practice, <clears throat> you could. 100 years is essentially indefinite and so so what would happen here this would become um, g150 and this would become 150 we we didn't have much radial loading on this we, we, we you need quite a lot higher radial loading okay And that gives you a C required of 8.5. And so, so for this light loading, this one, one point, well, 1,200 newtons, you could make, get a bearing, pick a bearing, even a radial bearing that beats us, 45, um, just the 200 would be, and that would be in practice pretty close to a depth of five. Um, would it then break? <laughs> well, I don't think I'd be around to know, but um, <laughs> so in that sense, from a practical point of view, you can get bearings that have more or less indefinite life. But the, all these things here are estimated from the um, from for this this factor here, which takes a while to run that test. And and so, can can you get a load where you just keep running? I'm not sure that people have answered that. Um, maybe, but from a practical point of view, if you put a hundred years of life in and go pick a bearing, then you, you've pretty much got yourself in depth of life. W yes, wouldn't somebody ask conjecture? Wouldn't performance the performance of the whole thing is going to deteriorate in, in that time? So, you, so your bearing has a depth of life because it's still going, whereas the, the whatever machine it's in may well be dead. Okay. So, in that sense, it's in depth. Any other questions? All right, uh, I'll see you not this coming Monday, but the following Monday. And I think you get quite a lot out of this case study if you put the effort in. If, if you don't, of course, you won't get much understanding. Okay, all right. Hey, Dr. Sinclair, just a question about those uh, in-class exercises that we're gonna be doing. 
Uh, yeah. You said they're going to be worth like a half point each. Yes, they'll be done in class. You'll have to do them on time and then you'll give them down to right there. You just have to submit something there to, to uh, handle it. Okay, uh, so it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't hurt us too much if we had a missed class. Like I'm just, I'm going to be flying all day, uh, coming back to Baton Rouge. I don't know if I'll be able to be in class. So it wouldn't be that big of a deal point-wise. Well, there's two, it's, it's like two problem sets. Okay, we're going to lose if we can't make it. Okay, so we'll uh, right. maybe maybe three counting the in class. Yeah, that probably probably used to make like three problems. Okay, but yeah, okay. you need to be there to get something out of this though, because this is not book work. It's not in the book. Okay. You might better go read this up. This is an actual practical problem. He, he's got several. I think he's going to do a, a bearing trade. Will the lectures be recorded like usual? Uh, yes, yes, he, he'll, he'll present them on Zoom. Um, uh, it, Muhammad will, will help him with that. And uh, uh, I think they'll be recorded too. Okay. I'll just catch up on them when I get back to the Yeah, okay. Yeah, it, it, it's a good case study. And this is, it's more or less what you're going to see in life. Okay. Um, there, there are some people think. A course like this, we should spend all the time doing applications. I don't think it matters how many applications you, you do, you're going to see new stuff when you get out there. It's more important to understand basically what's going on than, than to do more and more applications. So, that said, um, the couple of engineers are offering courses on, on practical applications. Um, they'll teach you some, well, I call it catalog engineering, which will, which will help you see what. You're likely to get when you get out. It's quite likely the first job you do though won't be one that they did. But then that's not criticism of them, but just the nature of engineering. My wife constantly says when I get a consulting job, I come home and I say, I don't know why they're hiring me to do this. I've got no experience with say, well, the last one was hydraulics of mining machinery in West Virginia. <laughs> well, you know, that's because you've done this for a number of years and you learn to know what you don't know and go out and get it. That's what you have to do. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, how would you go about estimating this radial force for the bearings? Um, is this more um, coming from the like internal force from the shaft itself? Yes, it'll, 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 it'll almost certainly come from the shaft. And, and most of these shafts, uh, have some gearing on them, which puts a radial load on them, or they have some pulleys or chain drives, and that puts radial load on it. And then that radial load goes through the bearing. So if you have external forces like that, wouldn't that um, be kind of an uneven load on the bearings then? Oh, um, it could be, but most of the time, you, you know, when you, when you, even when you run your car, you, you run at reasonably constant RPM. Uh, most of the time. And when you're running machinery, that, that's usually the case. I mean, if you're running a, 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 a belt uh, with supplies or something on it, then you'll have a certain rate of production, which will be set. So that when it's got a certain product on it, it runs at a constant rate. So, so there are some variations, but not very often. And, and so they're very low cycle. So those variations you don't usually worry about. So you, you worry about variations that occur in each revolution, that that's serious, okay. But because you've got, you know, oftentimes hundreds of RPM or thousands of RPM, so they're accumulating. They get lots of cycles. But when you change modes of operation from one product to another, uh, that might occur, say, four times a day or something like that. And and so it doesn't really constitute fatigue, even though it's varying. You don't worry about it. Okay. Thank you. But yeah, it's like the sort of stuff we've done in the past. If you, you get these loads and you, you assume they're constant, that's a pretty reasonable assumption uh, under most operating circumstances. <clears throat> Would you um, assume that because of these loads being unevenly distributed like that is why the formulas don't really match up with the data? Why the formulas don't? Oh, the form, I showed a bit of scatter. The book shows quite a lot of scatter. You can see that. I didn't bother showing it. The, when you get fatigued lives, there's quite a lot of scatter in, in the, in the life. Um, 
let's see, plus or minus 20%. Uh, you know, you have the same load on exactly, and, and you get a variation of plus or minus 20% in the life. Okay, so it's quite, but what's typically done, is, as I tried to show you in the little figure there, is you draw your line below the weakest points or the ones that failed at the lowest life. And so you, you've tried to be conservative in drawing that line. <clears throat> uh, okay. Yeah. And that, that, that just helps you. And you have another implicit way you're doing this. That's called your safety factor. So in, in fatigue, you, you usually have a safety factor of two or more, quite often three. And that's filled out for variation too. But when people are giving you the data, they've already tried hard to, to worst case things. So the data is conservative. That otherwise you have a much bigger safety factor. Okay, got you. Thank you. But then there are some guidelines in the book which, which I read are not too bad about safety factors. I didn't bother going through them with you. Um, first of all, you can read them, but um, they're an attempt to give you what safety factors are. The reality is there will be practice when you get out, and they'll tell you what the safety factors are. Okay, and and they'll vary from job to job. But they'll tell you that the, range, the, the guidelines they give you in the book are not unreasonable at all, but, uh, but the reality is that they're going to tell you. And sometimes they have funny safety factors, you know, 3.3 or um, 3.36 or something like that. Yeah. It, it, it's almost traditional, but, but it, based on experience, it's almost certain to work. And, and you know, in, in general, like in practice, would do you use I'm, i mean i'm where do you what charts are you using in practice are you using these charts that you're showing us or are there like different charts that you decide to use when you get mm -hmm. out okay well to start with this, this is not a bad book so you can you can look see if it's a relevant chart in the book okay the other thing is that there'll be other engineers wherever you're working and they'll have charts and the third thing is you can go online and, and you can find you there there are oh dozens of bearing manufacturers that would have um, certain geometry and a lot of them would have low carrying capacity and some of them might have changed this number okay this is a, this is a common number one of the reason I gave you but some of them may have done perhaps 10 to 6 cycles because they do the test faster it, it's arguably a little less reliable so th this is a good number <clears throat> so so you, there are three sorts of people this may well be one of the books that you don't want to sell, you want to keep because it's got some applications in it. You'll gradually find um, other books yourself. There's online information, extensive online information, and the plant you go to work for, the people working there will be happy to share uh, data with you. Okay, got so I, don't, I don't think it's very hard to get data. Okay. First shot, I just go and look in the book and see if there's something. Okay. <clears throat> the book's not too bad. Okay, thank you. you. Any other questions? All right. Uh, I won't be around next week for office hours. Um, it'll be the following week. I hope you get quite a bit out of this case study. I think it's uh, like the real world.